Welcome everyone and happy Leap Day. Thank you so much for joining us for our first ever Decoded Live. This is our new event series by OutSystems Developer Relations for and featuring our developer community. We've got a really packed show for you today, including event announcements, product updates, and our panel on DevSecOps, so let's jump in. My name is Eliza Mulcahy, and I am the community manager for OutSystems in North America. My job is basically to engage our developer community through events, user groups, and now live streams. I'm tuning in from uh, sunny but snowy Western Massachusetts in the United States. We'd love to know where you all are joining us from, so please let us know in the chat. I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague Cecilia to introduce herself. Cecilia? Hey, Eliza. So excited to be here. I am Cecilia Martinez. I am a developer advocate uh, here at OutSystems on the advocacy team. So I work with everyone at OutSystems to ensure that y'all have great resources and programs available to grow as OutSystems developers. I am joining from much warmer Atlanta, Georgia, uh, on the East Coast here in the South. And I'm so excited to be joined by the guests that we have to here today to share all their insights with you. So our first guest is uh, my colleague, Katerina. She's here to chat about a really exciting, brand new in-person event series we're doing this year. Katerina, take it away. Well, hi, everyone. It's really nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me on the very first Decoded Live. Super excited about this. Um, but let's go. Let's dive into our new program, which is called Developer Days. So Developer Day is just like quickly going through it. It's going to be a one-day event. It's going to happen in several locations around the world. And it's going to have amazing developer content from both out systems and community experts. So it's all about coming together, uh, sharing all the knowledge, fostering all of the community, and leveling up as professionals. For everyone watching now, you already have the slide there, so just grab your calendars and make sure to mark these, very, these two very important dates. So the first one is going to happen in Tokyo, Japan on April 26th, and the second one is set to happen in New York on May 1st. So this is completely locked, so ensure that you're there. Um, the registration pages are live for both events, so make sure to register if you're near um and someone will put the links on the chat so if you find them there please do check it out register um and we're also opening the call for speakers you know so this is really about our community we really want to hear from you we have some amazing speakers from obviously out systems as well um but it's really important that you also come and you also connect with everyone and i don't know just it's the perfect opportunity to just take that article you've been writing or you already wrote uh, or that topic that you're super passionate about um, or just share your experience with the broader community. So we would love to hear from you. Don't be shy. Um, the last thing I have to say is that stay tuned because these are not the only dates we're going to launch. More events are coming um, and we'll release them as soon as we can. Um, and I'm also a bit curious. I know that you already shared where you're coming from, but where would you love to see the next event happen? You know, what are the preferred locations you want the developer days to reach? Uh, so drop your thoughts on the chat. And I look forward to seeing all of you on the developer days, hopefully. Thank you, Katarina. I'm really looking forward to seeing our community in person at Developer Days. Um, I have travel booked already. We're going to be there. We're going to see you. Very exciting. Um, Cecilia, who's joining us next? Yeah, I, I have to say first, I am also excited for developer days. Uh, I've heard only great things about all of these community events, and I'm so excited to see everyone in person. So as you know, OutSystems is always working hard and the team is working consistently to add new features and to make everything better for you um, and your developer experience. So I'm excited to have Dan Orge from the product team for the OutSystems Developer Cloud, or ODC, as we refer to it, here to share some updates with y'all. Uh, Dan, how's it going? Hey, going great. Thank you. You actually nailed my last name, so great job. Yes. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here on the first episode of Decoded Live, calling in from all the way from a very cold uh, Utah in the U.S. Uh, happy um, Leap Day, by the way. Uh, fantastic that it's on this today. So yes, I'm excited to say that we released recently relaunched a, a new dashboard related to app security and DevSecOps. 
Uh, I think it's going to be a big win for our security minded customers as it will help provide visibility and operational control over the remediation of vulnerabilities. Uh, with this new functionality, we now have the ability to patch running applications without disruption and without downtime, while also giving developers control over when this happens. Uh, we now ensure that applications are both available and compliant at the same time, which will provide confidence to the CISOs and their security teams out there that their apps that are hosted in ODC are free from vulnerabilities. Uh, I'm happy to say that so far we've seen uh, hundreds of apps successfully patched. And, uh, you know, we've put a lot of technology in behind the scenes to make this happen. We've tried to make it very easy to use. And so we are excited to get some feedback on that. Wow, that's awesome to hear that there's already hundreds of apps that have been impacted by this new feature. So how can developers get started? Oh, well, the best way to see this in action and get started is to log into the ODC portal directly and navigate to the new app security screen. Uh, within the portal, we will show which applications need attention, and this is a scenario where it's uh, no news is good news type scenario, uh, meaning that if the screen is blank, then everything is okay and there's no vulnerabilities. However, if there are apps that need some attention, then it is as simple as performing a one-click publish on the app, and the app will automatically get the latest patches. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, that I always love it when I get no updates, no, no, no notifications, no warnings. That's always a good sign. But it's good to know that ODC is there to handle that for me uh, if something does come up. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much for being here and for sharing that with us. Excited to see what developers think of this new feature and any feedback that they have. So if you're on ODC, make sure to check that out and keep us posted. Thank you so much, Dan, for being here. Thanks, Celia. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. So uh, we're here for the DevSecOps panel, so let's get into it. Um, we have two expert guests joining us, one from the OutSystems Solution Architecture team and one from our amazing group of MVPs. Uh, before we let them introduce themselves, I'll just remind everyone that we'd love some questions from the audience. Um, I will be monitoring the chat as questions and comments come in, so ask away. And please excuse me if I'm looking down here i promise i'm paying attention uh so let's start with fred i'm gonna have you go for first why don't you introduce yourself thank you eliza hello everyone i'm fred gruen i'm a, a senior solution architect with OutSystems. i've been here for about two years and i'm thrilled to be with here on the inaugural edition of decoded live uh, especially on leap day so however you guys line that all up is uh, is fantastic uh, so just a brief background about me. Um, prior to joining OutSystems, I led security and compliance for a market research firm based in Kansas City, and that's where I'm um, streaming in from today, Kansas City in the in the U.S. And um, so from there, I led um, SOC 2 audits, pen test summaries, um, was responsible for um, all of the um, in, you know, employee security awareness training, uh, and then also uh, developer training as well. So um, happy to be here at OutSystems and happy to uh, talk about uh, DevSecOps today. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here, Fred. Uh, Remco, could you introduce yourself as well? Yeah. Hi. Welcome to be here, Cecilia. Uh, my name is Remco Dekinga. I'm joining now from the Netherlands, from The Hague. Um, and uh, yeah. I'm uh, OutSystems MVP, uh, working with the uh, OutSystems platform now for 17 years, which is quite a while. Uh, I have done quite a lot of things with different customers, different clients, uh, and recently I started for myself and uh, ready to help uh, customers uh, with, with architecture questions, with security questions, uh, and, and uh, yeah, happy to be here too. So. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. One of the things that I have loved learning about as I've gotten to know members in the OutSystems community is just how long lived and experienced, you know, some of y'all are with OutSystems. So uh, just thank you for, for being a part of the community for so long and for all the contributions that you've made uh, during that time. So great. Well, I know that everyone's excited to dig into some of the, you know, technical questions related to DevSecOps. Uh, first, I do want to kind of get to know a little y'all a little bit better. So we have a, an, a question to start, an icebreaker question, so to speak. Uh, so uh, Fred, we'll start with you. What was the first programming language or technology that you ever used? 
So the first um, the first technology I ever used was uh, the first computer that we had in my house growing up was an IBM PS2 Model 40. So this was pre Windows, um, two three and a half inch floppy disk. You know the hard things you used to plug into a computer and then eject out. Um, and so from from that and that was running DOS 3.3. So learning things like the copy command and and creating little batch files, those kind of things. Uh, also did a little bit with BASIC and. In high school and then in college, um, I had to do um, t um, took some courses that required me to learn Pascal. And then I learned that no one uses Pascal after um, <laughs> after I got out of school. I was like, oh, wait a minute. Why did I spend time learning this? But it was more about the concepts and how to develop algorithms and those things. So that's the. Um, um, that's what I learned. But now today um, I'm helping uh, my son, um, who's really big into Minecraft, but also um, we're learning the, uh, the um, you know, programming concepts through the uh, Scratch application. We just built uh, last year, my son and I built a uh, Raspberry Pi um, computer, and now we're, that's uh, running a, a home automation server. So we're, we're having fun with that. And so that's really, I, I really enjoy um, seeing what we can use technology for to help benefit um, us, even if it's just automatically turning the lights on without flipping a switch. Oh, very cool. Oh, I wow, love that. Speaking of long lived, you know, experiences with technology, uh, that's great to hear. Remco, how about you? What was the first uh, programming language or, you know, programming technology that you, that you used? Yeah, the first one I started with is really a long, long time ago. Uh, we had a Commodore 64 at home. And uh, we had a magazine, and in the magazine there was uh, uh, not a programming language. Well, it, it was uh, it was uh, hexadecimal coding. It was printed out in a, in a magazine, and I typed that over to play a game. So that's why I started. Um, I really didn't understand anything of what I was typing. I only need, needed to be sure that every letter needed to be correctly typed in. Couldn't make any mistakes, otherwise the the, the, the program wouldn't run. Uh, that's what I what I started with, and uh, yeah. My first job was in the official Fox Pro. It's also something you don't hear that often anymore. Then I switched to Java, .NET, and OutSystems. So, wow, very there. cool. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you for sharing. I just always like to see you know all the different varied backgrounds of people in the OutSystems community. I can share a little bit about myself too, in case folks are curious. Um, I really, I, you know, I think like, like a lot of people, maybe in my generation, um, I used like Neopets and LiveJournal and started learning some, you know, HTML and CSS um, when I was younger. Yeah, when I got into college, I learned WordPress and kind of um, fiddling with the PHP and got really a long way of just using the WordPress platform until, um, you know, in 2018, I started learning more JavaScript and kind of different solutions so um yeah i think i think it's funny how a lot of it starts with games you know just wanting to kind of figure out how things work under the hood once you start playing with things so well the things that we're going to be talking about today are maybe a little bit more serious than games you know devsecops is something that is really important and i know it's critical to a lot of teams and so we're really i'm really glad to have you all here today to share your expertise the thing about DevSecOps, though, I know that I can ask, you know, 10 different people and get 10 different definitions of what it is. So I think to start to make sure that we're kind of on the same page, I'd like to ask, uh, I'll start with you, Remco. What does DevSecOps mean to you? Yeah, to me, it means that, uh, yeah, you, we, we all know DevOps, where you have your development in your operation cycle. Uh, and, and with DevSecOps, you, you incorporate the security part uh, within your whole DevOps cycle uh, uh, from, from start to end. So every step of the way, you will always think about security or you will do something with security. Okay, great. And Fred, what about you? Do you agree with that definition? I, I do. I really think of uh, DevSecOps as really just the embedding of security at, in all parts of the life cycle, just as Rimco said. And um, But no, more 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 often, you kind of hear about DevSecOps as security, you know, in, inserting themselves into the process and that's really not not the not the true definition of the way i see it it's really more of this partnership and really applying guardrails to the whole DevSecOps process right so the whole thing if you think about if we just take that full analogy to um you know say so what is a guardrail right well when you're driving a car guardrails are those little fences along the lanes to make sure you don't go off the road well that's what DevSecOps is, right? It's really making sure that the code our developers write and the um, operating systems and the machines and all of the workloads that our operations folks um, use, making sure that changes to either one of those doesn't co cause an application to go off the road, right? So, or to become vulnerable to an attack. 
that's what we're trying to do. It's not trying to assert dominance saying, well, the security team is going to say, no, you got to do it this way, right? We're trying to protect the application. And um, our friends from um, Dynatrace have this great image, and um, maybe this is a great time to show it. But we have these, um, uh, this, this really, this, I mean, everybody's seen the DevOps, in, you know, infinite loop cycle about, you know, uh, you know, you plan, you, you write your code, you build, test, release, deploy, operate, monitor, right? We have that. But what really this, this, the security part of that is just really putting those guardrails around all of those processes. Lots of folks kind of think it's like, well, okay, let me have, I need automated tests um, before I deploy my code and automated security tests. That's what I really need. I need to test authentication. I need to test sessions. And if I have that, that's DevSecOps. Yeah, not really, right? It's the full cycle. And it's talking about operations and you know monitoring. What are you monitoring for, right? What 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 type of security events are you monitoring for? Are you looking at um, you know number of invalid login attempts? Are you looking at um, you know length of session? Are you looking? Are you scanning for secrets uh, in your code, API keys, those kind of things, right? It's the full cycle, and I think that's where a lot of organizations that are really new to their DevSecOps journey they kind of they they really struggle of where to start. And uh, and what they and how they apply it. Yeah, and and Fred, to that point, you know, if you are really talking about implementing security across the entire software development lifecycle, that's a lot, and that can be really overwhelming for teams, right? And so, I think one of the questions that comes up a lot that I see, and I'm really curious to know more about, is how can teams begin implementing? Like, what's the best place to actually start with DevSecOps? Uh, Remco, I'd love to get your insights there. Yeah, I think you start uh, uh, at the beginning. So uh, you start with the development team. That's the, the first team that is going to do something with, with security. So you have to train the developers on what is security, how, how do you uh, work with security? So what are the measures you have to take when you are developing? Uh, after that, you will start with the testing phase. So uh, how can we test for security? Uh, and then after release, you will have some 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 pen testing. Uh, and when you operate, as as Fred already mentioned, we have some. You can do some security monitoring. Monitoring. You have to understand what is it uh, that I'm monitoring for, and what do I do if I have a finding? Do I patch it directly? Do I go back to my DevOps cycle and do I start over uh, with planning with security in 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 in, in the back of the mind? And that whole process from beginning to end, so uh, is is the part that we need to look into uh, with DevSecOps. And starting is with the development team itself. Yeah, and, and Remco, I I completely agree, and I'd just like to add on to that and just say at the you know, and, and I really like what you said. You know, start small, start with a development team, but I I really think you can even start further ahead in the cycle, like your. Um, you know, your business process owner, your um, key stakeholder, right? As part of that agile, you know, that, um, you know, whether it's, a, you know, whether you name it a product owner, product manager, whatever, right? Make sure there's education involved there because that requirement development process of say, okay, here's our feature that we're going to have, right? You know, DevSecOps says every new feature really should have a threat model. Well, how many does, do developers know how to create a threat model, right? Do they know those four key questions to ask? And, um, you know, it's like, so what are we working on? What if something goes wrong? What are we going to do about it, right? And did we do a good enough job of put, putting controls in place to prevent this? And so having that discipline and <clears> having <throat> that, because a development team can say, hey, we're going to put apply DevSoc practices. But then when the, the you know project manager, technical lead says, well, hey, how come this feature isn't done yet? Well, we had to put all these security things in. Well, what's that, right? There's so many other outside pressures on a development team. And it's not just the, the, you know, the, uh, the developers, but it's also the, you know, the, the UX folks, the, you know, the, um, you know, the, the product manager, pro or project manager, that they're trying to hit a delivery date. And so you need really that buy-in from the top down. I mean, I'm talking like CIO level and say, yes, we're starting this process, but I need CIO leadership to say, yes, we can make this, you know, we're going to follow this process. And yes, initially we may not do it right. We may fail fast. We may miss some deadlines, but we're going to do it and we're going to learn. And that's the, the whole thing about all of these processes, whether it's DevOps, DevSecOps, um, quality assurance, it's the creating that feedback loop, 
right? And you have to have a safe place to create that feedback loop that, yes, we created this feature and, oh, this unintended consequence happened. Now we have to go back and fix it so that these security tests pass. Great, right? That shouldn't be a, well, we missed our deadline by two days and now the business is upset, <laughs> right? And it's No, that's not the point. You've got to build those, you have to build that, um, that culture of it's okay to fail, but fail fast, learn from it, and that's really why one of the key tenets of OutSystems, right? We have the platform that allows our developers to innovate. You know, with one click publish, they can basically view, you know, view the results of their app quickly, learn from it, and then go back and adjust via, the, um, you know, via the IDE and, ser and Service Studio. I love that about our platform. And so DevSecOps is really um, is, is taking that to, to those processes and just applying them to those planning levels so that everybody's on board. So when something does go wrong. There's not this consternation of, oh, we missed our deadline or now I've got to work, you know, extra hours this week because someone, you know, didn't write a security test the right way. That's um, so thank you for letting me interject and go on my little rant. That's just probably probably one of many. But it was I, a I great know. rant. Thank you so much. Right. Yeah. No, you had to score it, Eliza. What would you score that rant? Oh, uh, 10 out of 10. Uh, oh, unfortunately, our yeah. video stream is not a 10 out of 10. So we have to take a quick break to try to fix it. I'm sure you're all enjoying our frozen, um, horrified faces, but <laughs> we're just going to take a, a couple minute break and be right back uh, with a beautiful, smooth stream for you all. All right, we are back. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, I think somebody mentioned that it's kind of like so some leap day shenanigans going on potentially with the with the stream, but uh, that that's what happens when you're live. And so we're, we appreciate everyone bearing with us through the technical issues. So, uh, you know, we were right in the middle of the panel uh, where we left off. Uh, Fred and Remco were talking about the importance of the entire organization really being bought in when it comes to DevSecOps. And Remco, have you seen that as well? I mean, you've been without, you're working without since for 17 years. I'm sure you have a lot of experience. Have you seen when it does and maybe doesn't work when you don't have that organizational buy-in? Uh, I, I do have seen uh, a lot of uh, uh, customers of our systems that they have parts in. I think I've only seen one or two customers that, that really have the full uh, DevOps, Dev, DevSecOps cycle in, in place. But what you normally just see is that, hey, let's just do a pen test somewhere at the end, just a week before we go live. And we get a lot a, a lot of findings and then uh, we have to de de delay the, the go live date. That is what you normally see, which I don't think is, is the best uh, way to do it. Um, it's a start because you do something about security. You can also skip the pen test and do nothing and hope for the best, which is even worse. Um, but yeah, uh, not enough uh, uh, outsystems customers are, are taking it uh, as serious as it needs to be. Yeah, and so far we've talked about DevSecOps, you know, as a concept or as a process. And so I want to dig a little bit more into what tools that teams can use. You know, once you have the organizational buy-in, you maybe have an idea of where you'd like to start, whether it's with testing or with security. Um, you know, Fred, where have you seen OutSystems developers specifically start to leverage DevSecOps using the tooling that's available? Well, so that, that that's a great question. I mean, I, I've seen um, developers use APIs to integrate with their uh, change control systems, and um, and so from a deployment standpoint, you know, so basically when they hit uh, one CP, you know, a, a various ticket either gets created or updated. So I, I, I've seen that. Um, also, um, I, I've I've heard of customers um, triggering a, a part of their deployment process using Jenkins or other types of tools to um, um, basically start start other um, their their own security uh, scanning tools using SAST or DAST type schools uh, tools such like as Nessus or Veracode to scan their own um, um, you know code or applications or or things or, or other parts of their um, infrastructure as well. So I've seen that uh, occur. Um, you know it's really interesting. Some of the things that um, you know I've talked to um, the security leaders on our side here at OutSystems and got some really great insight on how they view DevSecOps as well. And some of the things that um, really, that our team is really trying to use is to really leverage automation and such as, hey, 
every time there's a new repo created or updated, you know, let's make sure that it's enrolled in our SAS scanning tools so that it doesn't get missed, right? So it's like, oh, okay, this new team just spun this this new repo up. Well, is it being scanned? And it's like, well, yeah, yes, it is automatically. The developers don't have to do anything to specifically get that set up. Um, so that that's really good. Also, we enroll those same repos in an, an another SAS scanning schools tool that's automatically looking for secrets, looking for exposed API keys, passwords, um, you know, et cetera. So that is um, just knowing that we have those things in place internally. So for, for the, our, um, you know, our uh, R&D team that's working on ODC and um, Lifetime, we're, we're following those uh, to the best of our ability, DevSecOps practices. And it's not just tools, but it's also processes. So security architecture reviews, um, threat modeling that happens. So when a, um, we use JIRA internally, so a new JIRA ticket gets created for a feature. There are steps to make sure that, you know, there are threat modeling uh, artifacts that are, cre that are created. There's reviews at the end of the process. So when a, um, an item gets marked as done in JIRA, then there's, it has to be a security sign-off in review, right? And then also um, that, that's where part of that feedback loop comes through. We also have um, automated process or uh, external processes for, you know, pen testing. So our, just like our customers want to have their applications pen tested before they have to go live to meet some type of their internal policy. We do the same thing. We use an external firm to um, pen test our apps. And, and Remco, I really like what you um, said, how some, how uh, some companies will um, you know, they'll conduct conduct one random pen test, and then all of a sudden now they have to you know delay their uh, deployment by two or three weeks as they got to go with, you know you know address the findings. And I really think that we'll be seeing, and I've seen a couple of companies that are, are investing in this space of uh, the micro pen test or the continuous pen test. You know, it's an external firm that that say, okay, you give them the details of your application and say, so, you know what, I just don't want you to test me, you know, for a week and uh, a combination of automated and manual testing. I want you to continually test it while that application is running. And then if there's any drift or findings, you immediately notify. And part of that is that seems daunting, right? Because applications get complex, they grow, right? And so, but then also that the amount of time to test grows. And I think that what we're gonna see as time evolves is that the, with pen tests, is it's this whole strategy of a micro pen test. You know, detect what's changed. I don't need to test the whole login function if the login function hasn't changed. Oh, but we've tested how this, uh, you know, we've changed, you know, how sessions are, are stored or we changed, you know, properties of a session or a timeout value, or we've changed uh, this, this function. We'll just test that, right? And so that allows, it kind of really sinks in with the whole DevSecOps process of doing everything, uh, just, just doing, you know, I wouldn't say the minimum, but just, you know, test what's changed, you know, verify that. If it's um, then, you know, if you find to have a finding or an issue, you know what's changed. You, you know, you, you've identified the source. Go fix that. Retest. You don't have to retest the whole application. Just retest of what you found. And then if you have this continual pen testing effort um, in play where it's automated, then so, so then you, you have really solidified uh, that whole external threat. Um, and then some companies like like OutSystems, we also have a team of internal pen testers as well. We have a, a small team that does nothing but just tries to break lifetime service studio ODC, right? And so they are attracted with that, tasked with that function as well. Um, I like to call them our internal disruptors, um, but they're, um, but that's such a key resource to have uh, to try to have those findings because just like in quality assurance, you know, the, the you, every we've all seen the hockey stick charts, right? The later you find a bug, the more expensive it mm -hmm. is. Well, the same with the security finding, right? Security findings are really just bugs, but they're bugs that have a pretty big impact, right? If they're exploited, they're the same thing. The sooner you find it and fix it, um, the sooner it can be addressed and remediated. So I think that's my second long-winded dev sec up. <laughs> so um, apologies for that. But I'm really passionate about pen testing. In my last place, I led 14 pen test assessments a year. And they were all the, the, basically the same as far as, okay, we're going to be testing for one week. Give us all the details, the URLs, the you know, the logins and everything we need. And then we're going to have a report. And the report and the vendor we used was fantastic. I mean, they gave us great findings, but then we had to make decisions on, okay, are we fixing these? Are we not? Are we, do we think this is a false false positive? We go through that process. And our developers, and I, I'd go take this to the dev teams that were responsible. And like, why are we doing this? Why are we you know, breaking this? But if you built it as a regular process, then it's just, okay, hey, we built a secure app. Mm -hmm. This is just part of what we do to ensure that our applications are are, are secure. 
Yeah, it's it's interesting because I'm sure there's lots and lots of horror stories out there. I'm sure Remco and Fred, between the two of you, uh, you could probably spend hours talking about the different things that you've seen go go right and then but also go wrong with DevSecOps. And it sounds like it's really about striking the balance of having, yes, it's continual, it's across the entire software development lifecycle. So it sounds big, but the individual components of it should be small and scoped. And that's how you are able to manage that throughout the entire process. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing those insights. And I know that we did have some questions coming in. You know, we wanted to uh, encourage y'all to ask your questions for Fred and Remco. Uh, Eliza, has the chat posted anything for us? Yes, we have a few. Um, I'm going to start with this first one here. Um, will low-code platforms like OutSystems become more prominent alternatives? Um, and this is a bit of a spoiler for our next episode, I think. But... Uh, could low-code platforms like OutSystems eventually become automated by AI itself? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think, um, Fred, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I mean, we've all heard about AI in various capacities over the last two years. And in fact, you know, OutSystems has been using AI um, or a form of it for many, many years. I mean, in um, with the Service Studio and all of the things that it learns, right? And you, you know, you say, hey, I want to connect to this entity and then, uh, you know, right click and it generates, automatically generates all of these um, uh, functions and properties and features for you, right? Or I want to drag a uh, drag an entity from a, um, you know, from the list of entities to the screen and boom, here's an instant table. Here's all of these, um, you know, all these features and functions you're probably going to want, like, you know, scrolling and, you know, pagination and those things, right? So that's, so we've been um, on the forefront of uh, using AI assisted development for many, many years. And so I think that we will see that naturally expand through the OutSystem platform, um, especially for those that may have heard of Project Morpheus, right? So that 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 will be, is, is, is using AI. Some of the demos I've seen, um, of just the, um, you know, hooking up to um, various, um, you know, various third party services and uh, uh, um, le uh, natural learning language models has been been impressive. But so but how do you take that to the development space and how do you take that to efficiency in something like DevSecOps? And I think it's um, really just kind of taking those best. What are the best best practices that, um, you know, other other um, I don't say developers and other, uh, you know, basically what are those best practices that people are using today? And mm -hmm. let's create a dashboard and say, okay, well, hey, you're not checking for secrets in your <laughs> in your application. Maybe you should, right? And come up with the, those list of those um, suggestions. And then it's like, okay, well then how do I do that? Well, then the OutSystem platform, and then again, this is just my imagination here and, you know, OutSystem platform 2028, you know, maybe it'll automatically say, okay, well, here's how, you know, here's the guidelines, here's the steps to implement it. And maybe it's just like as simple as one click publish, hopefully, like, okay, boom, now I have an automated uh, way to track if secrets are exposed. Um, yeah. And I didn't have that before. <laughs> I promise we will not hold, uh, you know, the product team to those, that roadmap deadline. <laughs> that, that would Fred be great. Suggested, yeah. but, uh, yeah, that awesome. Would be thank you. Eliza, what other questions do we have? This might be another one for Fred uh, and his um, uh, pr predictive mind, but is OutSystems looking at creating an offering either out of the box or as an add-on for SAST or DEST? Um, take it away. Yeah, so very predictive steps here. So I, I'm not speaking for our product team, first of all. Um, but here's here's what we what I can tell you. What is in um, our I believe is in our early access pro program. We do have uh, offering APIs to interact with your um, SaaS or DAS tools, right? So today, if you're an OutSystem customer, it may be a little bit of challenge. You have to you know, go through support request, you know, so file a ticket, um, request your source code, it gets sent to you, zipped up, and then you, you know, run it on your own tool, whether it's Nessus, Veracode, whatever. Um, so we are um, in early access for um, so um, APIs that will allow you hook up to your Jenkins process, your you know CI CD tools, and then automatically um, you know pull that code into your own um, pipeline, basically, and then you can run your tools and scan it. The challenge is, in, in my mind, there are so many different scanning tools. How do you support all of them, right? Um, and so, and let's say if we chose tool A, say, okay, we're going to have your, um, uh, you know, code run through tool A every time you hit one CP. Okay, great. 
well, there's going to be some customer or industry or regulation says, well, that's great, OutSystems, but we need it to run through this tool or we need it to run through. We don't, you know, we don't trust the results from that third party tool you're using. Right. So I think that's why our product team, again, my conjecture <laughs> is that we're, we've we're explored the rest of we want to give you the ability to run those um, um, those scans because we don't know your full um, internal and external regulations that every single OutSystem customer is subject to. So we wanna make that process efficient for you, but still you have the choice in using your own tools. How is that, Eliza? Loved it, loved it. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I think we have one more that uh, Remco might be able to speak to a little bit. Um, how can we change the culture for a more DevSecOps development, should it start uh, with the developers? Should there be a team evangelizing it? What do you think, Remco? Um, yeah, I think it should it should start with the developers uh, or with the CIO, wh whoever uh, feels the most pain um, should should be the one uh, evangelizing it. Uh, but probably the ones watching now are the ones feeling the pain. Otherwise, they wouldn't watch or they want to understand more. Uh, so I think these are the persons that that should uh, race uh, during a stand up or another meeting uh, that there needs to be done a little bit more about uh, security. So about Dev, DevSecOps to incorporate the security into your DevOps cycle. And you can start small. You don't have to do everything at once. So you don't need to uh, uh, automate your, your SAS to your dust uh, from day one. But it's something that you can work small. And uh, uh, the more you will do with it, the more the people that can make the decision to do more with it, uh, they will see the benefit of it. And they will allow you to experiment more and to, to automate more and to spend more time on that part instead of, I need new features. And I think that is how you start. You start small and you start uh, really uh, convincing the people uh, uh, that that hold the budget to spend more time on automation and uh, uh, security. Just to piggyback off of that real quick, I'm a big fan of champions programs, so security champions. And so some organizations don't have the resources to say, hey, we're going to stand up a whole team and we're going to implement DevSecOps and we're going to do this, you know, the right way. Some, especially small, mid-sized organizations just don't have that, uh, the resources to do that. And so I'm really a big fan of finding two to three developers, various teams, ones that they're, um, you know, supervised say, hey, they're, this person's really security conscious or has an affinity for security or automation. And then you train those people to say, um, you know, hey, you want to learn more in, in security? You want to take some, you know, certifications or you want to learn? Uh, and then, so, th but the, what that does, that basically provides a mentor for other developers to say, okay, well, hey, how, I'm, I'm building a login functionality. You know, what libraries do I need to pull in? What's the best way of doing this? Where do I store? Uh, how do I encrypt this value? And so you, you create other coworkers and people that have this knowledge and that they can go to, and then it, then it spreads naturally. So that's part one. But then part two is something that Remco really said, that, you know, convincing the people that have the budget to, um, you know, to, to get their buy-in. And that is so key and critical. When I learned um, various security training um, initiatives at my last place, I had to have the CEO and CIOs buy-in. And because if I didn't, and that meant they're in full participation too. So participation in monthly security awareness training, you know, phishing tests and all those things that we all love, right? right. Everybody loves those things. But I, I will tell you, because I had the support and I had uh, executive leadership coming on all hands calls and saying, hey, this is important. I'm doing it. I'm not exempt, right? I'm, I'm part of this. Um, then only then that was the way we were able to get to a 98% um, a, a completion rate on our testing and training efforts and reduce our clicking rates down to like sub 2%. And so, but but was it just me who the one leading the program and creating silly videos and those kind of things? No, it was that executive buy-in saying, this is what we're doing, this is important. You gotta have that. I can't echo that enough. Um, and, but to convince those leaders, right? They need to see that, you know, that you have people in place that are dedicated to this and they need to see the importance of it and they need to see what goes wrong. I've, I've learned this phrase uh, fairly recently about different types of security activities. You have um, 
you have left of boom activities and you have right of boom activities. And like, okay, so what's a boom? Well, boom is a breach, right? So what do you do after a breach? Well, those things are such as things like, uh, you know, you, you figure out when to call the lawyers, you figure out, you, you know, you call a forensics person, you, you know, you, 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 you in, initiate your crisis communication team, you go through all of those things that hopefully you have done a left of boom activity and practice that via a tabletop exercise, right? And so what we've been talking about today with DevSecOps is all left of boom, right? But sometimes executives need to know what boom is. And so some of the challenges I had in my last organization was going through a tabletop exercise and saying, our entire organization has been infected by ransomware. All employees can't access anything. Our systems are down. And, um, and we went through this very detailed scenario. And, I, and our head of marketing said, well, we'd have everything up by noon, right? <laughs> uh, no. No, this is a, a, a multiple day company crippling event and crippling to our customers. And that sounds funny and we can all kind of laugh and chuckle about it. But that education is necessary because our head of marketing is and isn't and shouldn't be thinking about, um, you know, what in the heck is going to happen if if we have a boom event. Right. You know, now, granted, it's I guess it should always be in the back of our minds. And as a security person, it's like, well, it's something I'm always thinking about. But no, our marketing folks are thinking about how to get more leads and how to get the right leads in for a company. That's what they should mm -hmm. and, and, and helping sales grow. That's their primary focus. Everybody has a primary and different focus. But if we can get everybody just to to to, to gel on this big picture of like, OK, why are we doing all this? Why are we spending all this money on tools and process and procedures? It's to prevent us ever needing to do those right of boom activities so we don't have a boom. And um, so yeah, I, there, there, there's I, my I, rant. Yeah. <laughs> and I do love the idea of that. You know, it's important to get organizational buy-in, but any person who is interested can be the one to raise their hand and to make sure those conversations happen. Right. So even as a developer, you're empowered to do that and to learn more. And it does help when you're at an organization that uses something like OutSystems because so much of that is built into the platform and you already have kind of that organizational cohesion. So awesome. Well, so many, so many great insights shared today. Thank you again very, very much for your time, Fred and Remco, um, for answering questions from our chat. I wish that we could spend hours talking about this. I know that there's a lot to dig into, but we do appreciate the time that you spent with us so far. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you, th thank you for having us also. Excellent. All right. Well, before we wrap up, uh, we did have a few more things that we wanted to share, um, especially regarding our community. Uh, so I would, did want to give a shout out. So Remco is, as I, we mentioned before, is one of our OutSystems MVPs. We recently welcomed the new class of OutSystems MVPs for this year. So OutSystems MVP is a really, like, great recognition because you not only have to have the technical knowledge of being an OutSystems expert, but you contribute to the community and you also share OutSystems with, with the wider development community. So it's something that requires a lot of commitment and a lot of work. And we are so, so, so appreciative of the work that the OutSystems MVP has put in. So if you are interested in learning more, you know, you can check out our MVP program, see who is in this year's class. And also maybe if you, you know, consider what you'd like to do to get yourself on this list next year. And you see your picture on the slide like this. Well done, MVPs. Yes, absolutely. And uh, we do have one more announcement or thing we'd like to cover. So uh, recently, in the past month, we have launched a mentorship pilot program between OutSystems and ADP List. Now, this program is designed to bring the and to leverage the expertise of more senior OutSystems developers to help out systems developers that are still growing and learning in their career. So during this pilot program, we had some really, really successful results. We had uh, more than 30 mentors sign up and they held 228 mentorship sessions, which is wild. I mean, that's over 7,000 minutes of mentorship magic happening um, and all that amazing knowledge transfer between these more senior out systems developers. Uh, so 164 mentees engaged in sessions and were able to benefit. And we are super excited about these results and what we've seen from the community and the response. So we'd like to keep this going. If you are interested in learning more, you can go to adplist.org in order to find or become an OutSystems mentor. 
Amazing. Uh, congrats to not only the MVPs, but um, also our newly minted mentors. Um, it's so great to see some familiar and some new faces in these groups. Um, uh, we have some links in the chat for more information, so please look into that. I know we're a little bit out of, um, out of time, but um, I just want to blame the Leap Day shenanigans here and <laughs> close out with one more thought. Um, so I had a blast with our guests today. Um, so thank you for, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do the dad joke. Thank you for taking a leap and joining us um, for the first ever Decoded Live. Um, but next show we're going to do on May 23rd, we're back for a discussion of AI, how AI is affecting the work of developers, how is OutSystems implementing AI in our platform, and what's on our roadmap for what Fred mentioned, Project Morpheus. We'll be joined by OutSystems co-founder and AI project leader Rodrigo Coutinho and OutSystems developer advocate Bruno Martino. We will plop the links once again in the chat um, for the stream and a little link to save it on your calendar. Um, hopefully we'll see you there. Um, thanks for everyone for joining us. Uh, thanks for our team behind the scenes for tackling um, a difficult video situation. And thank you all for tuning in for the first episode of Decoded Live. See you next time. Thanks, everyone.